Viewer discretion is advised. Chapter 6 Maya Culpa Sometime Earlier It had now been a few days after running into Kent, Ash, and Samel back in Arizona. They had all run into each other during one of their recent supply runs. Spooked upon the death of their friend and family member Thomas, the team were contemplating leaving Arizona altogether. The large caravan were making their way south, their destination, Cartago, a stopping point before continuing on to their final objective. They had been recently inspired to travel this route by a robotic-like voice coming over one of the channels on their radio sets. The air was filled with a slight mix of cool and warm breezes. A mere mist of precipitation remained from the sporadic showers that the monsoons brought to Central America throughout the warm summer season. It was afternoon, but the sun was absent, replaced by a thick fog, darkening the skies, casting marching troops of shadows throughout the vacant wilderness. They were about 150 miles out now. They knew they could make it that far with the gas that they had from just recently fueling up. Planning on gassing up once more in Cartago, they would then continue on from there to meet Paco, the old family friend of Seth's, unaware of the depraved baggage this particular contact carried along with him. They were hoping that this friend would provide them with an alternate route, avoiding the dense jungles. It was about the halfway point when Beck noticed something ahead. Debris and overgrown vegetation meandered through the recently formed cracks of the asphalt they traveled. On it, still a little way out, sat a peculiar deserted vehicle. The desolate highways were typically home to abandoned cars. This particular one, however, seemed out of place. It was a dark, burgundy car, 
pulled off to the road's shoulder, as if an altercation had developed. Quite often, a car was simply parked, as people passing through would often run out of fuel, deeming the car disabled. This one, however, was pulled to the side with what appeared to be some items spilling out of the ajar driver's door. Do you see that? Beck said to her brother. Trevor, in the passenger seat of the old station wagon, looked ahead and saw a car pulled off to the side of the road. This wasn't odd, as they came across abandoned cars all the time. What was odd was that the driver's side door remained open with a body laying outside of it. With its feet still in the car, the figure appeared to have simply fallen right out of the vehicle and was left frozen in place on the warm asphalt. The group of three mismatched vehicles slowed as they approached the suspicious scene. They were not sure if this was the result of an amateur gang or possibly Russian or even cartel activity. All they knew is they had to be careful. Any one of these scenarios were just as deadly as the next. As they slowly moved past it, they noticed a woman sitting up in the passenger seat, appearing lifeless. Just beyond the bizarre encounter, Beck pulled her vehicle over. What on earth are you doing? Jack asked from the back seat. Beck looked back at him. I saw something move in the back seat, she said, while focusing her attention in her rearview mirror. Trevor interrupted the conversation. All the more reason to get the fuck away from it, and the fuck away from here. His sister just gave him an exhausted look, silently but effectively placing a blame of paranoia on him. It's fine. Nobody's around. What if it's a little puppy dog? You said we should get a guard dog, right? Trevor rolled his eyes. This isn't what he had in mind when he had originally recommended the canine idea. They got out of the car, Jack included, and began to walk back to the other vehicles in their group. They explained their delay as they continued on toward the metal glassy tomb. The rest of their group looked on as they watched the three cautiously approach the vehicle. Trevor's hand was on his gun. He kept tucked into the back of his belt. Seth, in the Hummer, kept a sharp eye out. He kept looking ahead and in his rear view mirrors. As the curious three came up to the car, they were joined by Eugene and Anne. As they made their way past the front seat, they noticed a needle on the ground next to the man laying outside. He was wearing jeans and a blue flannel shirt. The seat belt had kept him from falling all the way out. A light buzzing sound came from a few flies that had taken advantage of the free meal. The woman inside had a light drizzle of blood protruding from a corner of her partially open lips. She was younger looking, wore tattered clothes, and her eyelids were slightly open. Overdose, Eugene piped up. No one responded, except for Beck and Anne, who both had shocked expressions on their faces, with utter heartbreak coming from their eyes. Their jaws both dropped at the same time. They were not responding to Eugene, though. They were simply reacting to the two young toddlers, sitting, strapped in car seats, in the back. A boy and a girl, very close in age. Beck slowly approached the two youngsters, with Anne close behind her. What's your name, little one? The boy spoke up. Caleb, he said with a tone of certainty in his voice. The little girl put a tiny finger to her lips. Shh, mommy and daddy are sleeping. Beck smiled at the two in their car seats, now in the back seat of their station wagon. Jack closed his door as he sat next to them. Beck returned her eyes to the road and slowly pulled away with two vehicles closely following. The nine travelers now became eleven, as the receding car in their mirrors now sat, completely lifeless. That evening, upon reaching Cartago, the group decided to stick with their plan on resting as they felt it would be dangerous to travel in the dark. After achieving their rest and fueling up the following day, they continued down the highway on the last leg of their trip and toward their final destination. Ash and Somel were sitting in the back of the Hummer as the three vehicles stuck closely together, the rusted down old station wagon leading the pack. Somel reached into his pocket and pulled out a tiny antique tape recorder. 
He sat lower in the bed to be less obvious. He then pulled out one of Jack's radios from one of the coolers. He held the recorder's speaker to the receiver of the radio. Simultaneously, he pushed down the side button of the radio and the play button on the recorder. A robotic voice came from the recorder. Repeating transmission. This is Zul. All networks back online. Properties are secure. Safe Harbor has been acquired. The recording then voiced several instructions regarding access codes and expirations as well as reciting the precise GPS location of the supposed safe harbor. Both now satisfied with their ruse to keep the rest of the group heading deeper south simply just smiled at one another. While sharing their nefarious schemes with the three, Paco and Kent, both sat on a couple of crates, facing Trevor and his two friends, Eugene and Seth. They were all in separate small new cages, just as Paco had promised them earlier. While sitting with their backs pressed upon the cold steel bars behind them, they held their knees up to their chests. The three of them held gazes at their two captors with pure resentment. The hard ground floor of the cramped steel enclosures only fueled their rage. The room they were in appeared to be some type of basement. It was darkly lit as only several kerosene oil-based lamps illuminated the atmosphere, casting dancing shadows along the interior walls. They could see a large steel table beyond Paco and Kent, gowned in a thin blue cloth that was obviously used for medical purposes. The work table next to it, however, held a much more sinister display as it was crowned with an assortment of crude antique medical devices. The most alarming of them all being a large, rusty amputation saw. Trevor, having gone through losing his grandfather to the vicious events that unfolded earlier, leading to the current development he now found himself in, was not letting the threatening surroundings faze him. He wanted blood, and he wasn't going to let his steely cell stop him. While looking at Palco, with a furious animosity in his scowl, he listened to his murderous adversary spew his diabolical narrative. While phasing in and out of the conversation, he took in a bit more of his surroundings. It was a small, square-like room. The walls were tan, and seemed to be made of a sandy-like brick material. There was a flight of stairs, curving around a corner, leading out of sight to the top of its dark extremity. The flooring wasn't completed upon construction of the building, as it was just hard, flat earth. The room was a blank canvas other than the freestanding medical tables and the caged hostages. You betrayed us, Eugene said as he looked at Kent. Kent? still wearing his black cargo pants and his white sleeveless shirt, gave a crooked grin to the speaking inmate. That's kind of the point. You were, after all, our property. And you too, he said, switching his stare to Seth and Trevor. She was just one girl. Why couldn't you let it go? Instead, you decided to take out an entire team of armed Russians. But more importantly, our clients. Seth's eyes lit up as he looked at Kent. It was all coming together. It was you. Kent moved his gaze directly at Seth and cocked his head as if to be amused in curiosity. Seth continued letting accusations fly. You followed us. A smile slowly spread over Kent's face. And, Kent asked as if to invite Seth to further his investigation. He gestured with his hand, as if he knew what Seth was about to reveal. Seth looked at him with a malevolent glare. You killed my father. Kent let out a loud laugh and looked over at Paco, who was also bursting into shrieks of laughter himself. Kent looked back at Trevor, then to Eugene while his laughter faded slowly away. Then he peered back at Seth and looked deep into his eyes. You should never fall asleep on guard duty. He gave a sigh and a shake of his head in a disapproving manner and threw a wink at Seth. 
He appeared gleeful as he began telling his story. It was extremely dark and silent. The stars over the Sonoran Desert pulsated more than ever as they had been liberated from their former prison of the distorting lights of civilization. A sprawling ranch crept along a peaceful, vacant town, emulating a tranquility one would find hard to resist. Thomas was basking in the moonlight, laying on a slightly reclined garden chair. He clutched a large assault rifle, as it was his turn to keep watch. They usually did this in pairs, for safety reasons, but tonight he insisted everyone should get their rest. Besides, he loved being alone under the dark wilderness sky. It brought him a sense of normality he rarely felt these days. Everyone else, with the drama of the day, were easily persuaded to let him be. He was probably three quarters of the way through his shift. The events that took place earlier that day played on repeat within his head. As he stared into the skies, he felt a sense of serenity take a calming effect over his body. He began to drift while his eyes slowly closed. The flashes of the day still permeating his thoughts were slowly being muted by the stillness of the surrounding desert. Suddenly, whipping him into a frenzy of panic, his neck was quickly being strangled by the rigid, rough materials of a sisal-like rope, now tightly around the underneath of his jaw. Ash and Samael began to yank the other end of the rope. It was woven through a horizontal support beam of the awning's rooftop. Thomas let out muted grunts as his fingers went from holding his weapon to trying to loosen the tightening rope, now asphyxiating him. He tossed around like a rag doll as he was hoisted up into the air. He felt his face begin to burn with what felt like boiling blood, about to burst from his eye sockets. Through the blurred vision of his rapidly shattering capillaries, he saw a man with a handlebar mustache approach him. Kent looked up at him as he held a large, serrated knife. You really need to stay more alert. These are dangerous times. With that, Kent made a swift, sweeping motion with his blade. Thomas let out a long, gasping sound of pure anguish as his mouth was opened wide in response to the assault. He could hear the splatters of what previously were the insides of his bowels hit the deck below. After seconds of sporadic tremors, his head fell along with his arms as his lifeless body swayed to the creaking sound that the rope and wood fixture made in unison. Just beyond him, in the open fields, three dark silhouettes dissolved into the night as the desert slowly retook its somber silence. Paco and Kent shook their heads in disbelief of the easy target. They looked at their caged audience, proud of their chilling recollections. So why didn't you just finish it? Trevor asked, with a tone in his voice that let his captors know he grew weary of their tales. Paco looked back at him. Santiago and Nicolas, brothers of the Chancellor, hired these men to acquire new assets not to have them ruined by the likes of you and your friends. So seeing that you guys had their stolen property, their jobs were clear. Trevor and his friends didn't understand. A look of confusion mixed with an intense growing anger swept over their faces. Kent leaned forward on his crate. He opened his arms wide to the three. Repossession of our property with interest. The three were silent in thought things weren't all adding up. Eugene broke the bewildered silence. Yeah, but why not just kidnap the entire group? Why kill Thomas? He paused and looked over at Seth, as if to apologize for the shallow remarks. That's why Kent is such a good asset to the Chancellor, Paco announced, always with his bright ideas. Kent picked up on his colleague's cue. We knew you just took out six Russians. We're not stupid. You see, when I was a boy, my father taught me how to hunt. He always told me, don't go after a fox. It will always out fox you instead. Let the fox come to you. Okay, okay, so you lured us here. 
We get that, Eugene said. That still doesn't explain Thomas. You could have lured him as well. Kent stared at Eugene. He rolled his eyes, sighed. He continued speaking, slightly louder, signaling to Eugene to shut up. His explanation wasn't done. Daddy also said, if the fox is sleeping, never breach his hole. Instead, upset the fox with him. Make him want to leave his hole. Leave it far behind. A smile grew over his face as the three prisoners realized their fates had been sealed once Beck's rescue mission was in motion. They didn't get away with anything. They were being watched, observed by the Chancellor's point man. And that point man didn't see a problem. He saw a bigger payload. But you were my dad's friend. How could you let this happen? Seth spoke up, addressing the casually dressed gangster sitting on the crate before him. He had hoped to appeal to Paco's better nature, if there was such a thing. Paco looked at Seth. That is where I am sorry, my friend. I was miles away, unaware of Kent's developments. It is, in your language, how you say, collateral damage. Once I saw Kent, his men, you and your buddies appear on the shore, I knew what had happened already. I was hoping to separate you from them, and maybe I have new recruit, eh? But then, you. Paco looked at Trevor. You had to go snooping around boat. No, this is unacceptable. Friendship too risky. If only I had my men keep a closer eye on Jack, eh? Paco laughed. Trevor. Now feeling overwhelmed by the realization that he was the hunted fox, looked at Paco. And the boat. How'd you get out? You were all in fucking cages. On the bottom fucking level. Paco and Kent shared glances and chuckled. Paco stood up and patted Kent on the back. He is so smart, this one. Kent looked up and smiled at his trading counterpart, then looked back at the three, proud of his stealthy nature. He regaled the threesome. We never left you. We just felt it a better decision to trail you from behind. You know, just in case you and your friends tried something stupid. This time, we were going to see our parcel through. Security detail, if you will. So, before you departed from the dock, we quietly snuck back and used a life raft Pauco lowered for us. We were with you the entire time, being towed out of sight, right below the rear deck. Of course, when things went south, it took us some time to get on board. By time we made it to the top deck, well, you and your friends were already heading to shore. Not seeing Pauco or his men with you, we quickly made our way below, he said, painting a clear picture of what happened next. The vessel was filling up with water. The lower level was almost completely flooded. The compartment with the cages that once held the poor souls on the brink of death now held Palco and his men. It was at the far end of the ship that was still somewhat above water. Still, the room was rapidly filling as Paco began cursing aloud. You fucking pieces of shit. This isn't over. Paco screamed out the best he could. Suddenly, the door to their watery would be grave, opened, casting waves of filthy seawater around it. In walked a soaked and alert man followed by his two cohorts. It was Kent, Ash, and Samael. Paco, relieved to see them, but still angry about the events that just unfolded, yelled to the three. Cabrones, do something. Get us the fuck out of here. Kent smiled to his three captive men as he ended his history lesson. Of course, knowing how armed you all now were and recognizing your relentless skills, we decided to flank your position in order to dry out, regroup, and corner you on the beach the next day. But by then, we found your camp empty. 
that's when we got word from the Chancellor's compound of your daring invasion. That's also when we knew our task just became more complicated. Thankfully, you decided to take his plane. A plane that's equipped with a private GPS signal which we have access to. So we simply gathered another aerial vehicle and proceeded to track you down. And here we are. Trevor looked at Kent. And the GPS location? Kent smiled again. Actually, that was a real broadcast. We heard that thing for ourselves years ago. We even decided to check it out. Place is a dead end. Trevor realized the men never discovered the lab below. Kent continued. Knew it would put you on the Chancellor's shores, though. Now, Paco was standing at the table which held the medical devices, near the gowned operating table. With his back to everyone, Paco interrupted the history lesson. Time to get started, boys. The three caged men looked at each other, then back at Paco. Seth couldn't help but to feel at blame for his team's demise. He felt like he should have seen this coming. It was also him that trusted Paco in the first place. Sorry guys, this is completely my fault. I am the reason we're here, he said to himself. He only wished he could tell them aloud. While looking over at Paco rummaging through the medical devices on the table, he couldn't shake the images of the five people he freed from the cages of Paco's yacht. What disgusting, horrifically painful events are about to take place in this dark, dingy basement? Are they about to become like one of those he had tried to save from the boat? Seth needed answers, as terrifying as they may be. What are you going to do to us? Paco answered, still facing away from them. We always try to recycle. Good for the environment, yes. Removing tracking devices from human flesh is easy. Just hack away. The human is already likely dead anyway, right? He said as he continued his horrifying words. Putting them into the flesh, the human alive, awake, twitching in sheer pain, much more tedious. Precision required. A steady hand is also good. Paco turned around and looked at the three. He held three very familiar looking GPS transmitters in his hands. They were each black, about a quarter inch thick, an inch wide, and about three inches long. Several wires dangled from them as he spoke. They each had blinking blue lights. By the way, the Chancellor wanted me to thank you for the GPS location of the five bodies you buried. A big smile grew over his entire face and his eyes lit up. These things are hard to come by these days, eh?